Hi everyone, and welcome to part three of Let's Consider Luke. I want to start before I even go into the text by addressing something that I figured it would be an issue. I'm sure there are some, uh, maybe even more than some, that th maybe consider Luke beyond question. Maybe I shouldn't be testing it, um, dissecting it. But we have to dissect and test everything, every claim. <clears throat> you know, a lot of people listening to this who, they're familiar with the the bad arguments and um, the authoritarian sort of rhetoric that's being used to get a lot of people to take an experimental shot. And, um, you know, there are a lot of people out there that they're not questioning things that they're passing off as science. They're not questioning the word of people that they assume are authorities. And it's going to wind them up in trouble. And, and all of us, by extension, it's going to wind us all up in trouble. So we have to test everything. And that doesn't matter if it's, if it's Luke, if it's Paul. It doesn't matter if it's Jesus himself. We have to test everything. And you know, the thing is, it's what Yahweh expects us to do. And he entirely allows us to do this. He wants us to use the minds that he gave us and try to logically, truthfully examine every claim. You know, one of the earliest stories that we have of um, detailed interaction between Yahweh and uh, a man is his interaction with Moses or Masha, in uh, Genesis, or uh, Exodus 3, I think it is. This is where um, Masha, Moses, is leading his father's flock, and he sees a burning bush, and he goes to it, and he, he speaks directly to Yahweh. And even though he's speaking to someone who's apparently, you know, I, I don't think he appeared to him in, in a form of a man or anything. It's a burning bush. But Moses still wants to see some kind of proof that he's going to have this power behind him and that he is, in fact, talking to the Creator and, you know, the sovereign being. And so one of the things he does, he's, Okay. He tells him to put his hand in his shirt. His hand was perfectly fine. Just put it in your shirt. Now pull it out, look at it. And it looked uh, diseased. It looked completely different. It had changed. He had, Yahweh had changed it to give a proof of authentication to Moses. Same thing with his his stick, his walking stick, or prod, whatever it was that he had with him. It was a stick. He told him to throw it on the ground. He throws it on the ground, and it becomes a serpent. So he gives him signs of authentication, and he does this with a lot of men that he uh, interacts with. And even, for instance, in the case of, of Gadaun, or Gideon, he asks for a sign of authentication three days in a row. And he's very apologetic about it, of course. And I would be too if, if I thought I was communing with the, the supreme being, the creator, uh, Yahweh, Aliyim God. So not for a moment does he not expect us to test everything. When we're, we're so fearful of, of testing things, there's, there's underlying reasons to that, which I, 
they're oftentimes not good or healthy. Um, for much of my life, I didn't question these things because, of course, what was ingrained in me was this idea that um, you know maybe I'd be struck by lightning. <laughs> Maybe I'd be struck by lightning and then sent to a burning, torturous hell forever. And those those emo emotional um, stories and what they imply and the fact that they're taught to us from such an early age. They have such a strong and powerful emotional grip on us. And, you know, in a similar way, because we're also taught from very early ages this, I remember one of the very early stories I was taught in a children's um, like Sunday school class. Children's, like kindergarten age, at least like children's Sunday school class, was the story of, and you, many of you might remember this, the story of the man whose name was changed from Saul to Paul. A story you can't find in the Bible. There's no story in the Bible about his name being changed from Saul to Paul. That's extra. That's, that's inserted. We see at a certain point he goes from being referred to as Shaul, Saul, to Palos, Paul. How did that happen? Where did that happen? Oh, I don't know. But then they make up these stories like the man whose name was changed. There's not even in any of the dialogue that Luke puts in Acts, if this is the same guy writing the two books. And from all evidence, it seems to be the case. There's nothing in there about his name being changed. And it's interesting, though that there's always this idea of, you know, even though you show Jesus put his authority squarely on the shoulders of Kappa, Shimon, Peter, Simon Peter, more than any other uh, apostle that he chose, somehow all that authority, like a bait-and-switch operation in the book of Acts, is transferred over to this Paul. This Paul that Yusho never mentioned, never interacted with, not once. This Paul, Saul, whoever, who was not an eyewitness to anything that Yusho did, but somehow he's able to speak with, with such authority, and, and so many of his letters included, in the New Testament that to use terms like overshadowing Peter would be an understatement. Now, and for this reason, a lot of people, not just in identity, um, Protestantism, Catholicism, they have to really wrestle with and come up with, in my opinion, uh, a lot of excuses for what they read in Paul to try to square it with a lot of statements from Jesus himself, or James, or John, or Peter, that seem to harmonize when even a cursory reading would, would tell a lot of people that they're out of harmony. So I, I think that a lot of us just have, a lot of us have programming that we were, uh, that was imposed upon us from the youngest ages. Programming not to question, we can't question, it's holy, holy 66 books in this canon. They all have to be holy. I mean, they're in the Bible, right? Um, and hey, if I question it, maybe I'll get struck by lightning or get stricken with cancer 
or something and I'll, I'll die and not be happy and go to hell forever. Or, well, Paul, I just, it's just such a wonderful story, the conversion on the road to Damascus, any of the three different ways it was told in Acts, just, ah, oh, it's so powerful, that story. And um, even though none of the specifics from that point on match up, like at one point it says he went, went straight back to Jerusalem after D Damascus, and interacted with the the actual hand-picked apostles. And then in another, he says himself, he didn't go to Jerusalem. He went to Arabia, probably the Ora Bay, for th like three years. They don't, they don't add up. They're, they're contradictory. A lot of it's contradictory. But for some reason, we don't want to look at it. We like Paul. Ah, like Paul. I'm gonna have to take down my. Uh, gonna have to take down my placard that gives all of the points of love from First Corinthians 13 if I do away with Paul. Paul teaches a, just a a mystical Jesus that I don't want to do without. I just like it. So why is it exactly that people get upset with me questioning Luke, which is by proxy questioning Paul, of course, because it's, it's Luke. Luke is the character, or whoever is writing under the pen name of Luke, so we'll just say Luke when we refer to the Gospel account according to Luke and the book of Acts. Luke is the one. Luke is the Don King of Paul. Luke is the entire body that gives all that weight to all those teachings of Paul, the book of Acts. No one but Luke. It's all on Luke. So, that's not why, and, and this is not a great term to use, it's not why I'm attacking Luke. I'm not attacking Luke. And, as a matter of fact, if, if Luke's gospel was just right on the money, then I would quite certainly have to affirm that. See, well, Luke's gospel's right on the money. Now, let's say I didn't agree with a lot of the teachings of Paul, and I thought they were very contradictory with those of Jesus and other apostles. But Luke, whose name is on the book of Acts, and it appears that this character wrote the book of Acts, but his gospel is, is dead solid perfect. It's right on the money. Then I'm honest enough to admit that. Now, I've been accused in the past of impropriety. But nobody's ever, nobody's ever proven that. Nobody's ever illustrated that. You know, I, I guess I can't do anything further than, than simply to just tell you that these are my intentions. Uh, I've never hid them. I've never hid who I am or who I'm becoming in all these years of, of looking into these things. And I have changed a lot, so I leave up a lot of that old material. And I know a lot of people start with that really old material, and they think that, like so many others out there, that I'm not going to change over the course of, you know, five or six years. But especially in today's day and age with, with all the lies that we're surrounded by. If somebody starts on a course of study or work, um, knowing anything, and they don't radically change over five years' time, ten years' time, there's something wrong with them. There's something wrong with them. They don't even have, they either don't have the mental faculties to pursue serious academics, or they're the ones who are improprietous. We really should change. And the, the thing is, I would fully expect 
five years from now that I would be very different than I am now based on the information I'm able to acquire in that time. This is, this is part or, or a big part of the point of me even producing material. Part of the point is, from the start, I just wanted interaction with people who were of, of at least like mind. And then as, as time went on, I wanted interaction with people who were of, um, not only of my same mind, because I, I get along with a, a number of people who are not part of my tribe, but I also wanted to interact with people who were part of my tribe, and then people part of my tribe with the same mind. Um, that's part of the reason I do this, which it would appear that YouTube and maybe even Discuss are working against that. And I can show you many, many, many examples from YouTube. And, and maybe I'll just make a video on this so I don't take up too much time in this video doing it. But I could show you examples. I don't have YouTube up, I'm sorry. Of um, massive amounts of comments that, that just get eaten by YouTube. They go right down the memory hole. And, and, and a lot of times they're comments that they don't even have any words in them. They could consider whatever. Or links in them that they could consider whatever. They're literally eating the, the vast majority of comments. They're gone. It isn't just YouTube. It's Facebook. You know, Facebook deletes a lot of posts of mine. And they send me messages. They were deleted. Why? Well, they were fact-checked by independent fact checkers and found to be containing false information or fake news. I love how they use that term fake news. Everybody who thought Donald Trump was your guy, he introduced it so they could perpetuate it and against us. So wake up. But that's kind of the thing, you know, um, they found out that just torpedoing channels and, and destroying accounts, that wasn't effective because that actually provided a, a sort of validity and they realized that a few years into it that's why they started this whole optics thing where they would torpedo channels like Alex Jones and uh, you know um, because people would see that and they would say look man they're they're persecuting Alex Jones man <laughs> it's, it's optics guys it's optics they understood that actually destroying a channel lent more authenticity to that channel. That, so they've stopped doing that. Um, and what they do now is they just employ a lot of tactics that make it harder for creators to upload things like BitChute. I'm still trying to upload episode 10 of the Obery Hours. It takes forever. I've already tried a dozen times, and I'm going to have to keep trying. It took me over 30 tries to upload episode 9 of the Obrey Hours. Comments being eaten. So you don't get the interaction that you want to get as a creator. You want to interact. You don't get that. The people listening don't get that because some of... Uh, I have people that are have been listeners for many years and I see their comments when they come up. They're just trying to communicate with me. But when I go to click on their comments so I can communicate back, it's gone. So they're putting up a wall like that. And I mean, after a while, people are probably like, well, it's just, I mean, it's no, it's no use. So, all right. Uh, at that, I know I'm already uh, like 20 minutes in, but it's okay. Those things really needed to be said. So I'm starting at, at Luke. It's chapter 6, starting at verse 20. Now this begins Luke's account of what we've come to know as the Sermon on the Mount, which at the end of the last video, and this is quite possibly why when you see those subheadings, um, like some, yeah, some Bibles have those subheadings in print, but a lot of the digital Bible tools will have all of those subheadings as you go through, you know, any of these books. 
That's probably why in Luke they don't call it the Sermon on the Mount, because I pointed out to you how just a few verses earlier, Luke says that he comes down from the mountain. He comes down from the mountain and he's standing in the plains. And then he teaches the people, which was at completely uh, at odds with Matthew, who says that he went up on a mount and, and taught the people. Like, anyone can can accuse me of anything they want, I guess, but I'm just pointing these things out, folks. Don't shoot the messenger pointing these things out. I'd love for all the four Gospels to actually, in reality, be complementary. That's what I would like. Because then I don't have to waste my time doing this, would I? Everything could be hunky-dory, and we, we could get on with, with knowing and understanding exactly what the Bible is saying, what it did say in the first place, and how we can, and this is the big one, the real important one, how we can apply it. Now, you know, my geographical work aside, which has become a real passion for me, the whole reason that I started studying the language, which I came to understand as Obri and not Hebrew, was not just an intellectual pursuit. An intellectual pursuit that's really only going to sustain you so long. This was so I could know exactly what was being said here. So that I could know, first off, I could continue to, to test everything, because we should, and also, more importantly, so I could apply it. I, I would think a great majority of people who listen to this, that's, that's why they are also listening to this. That's why many of you do study the Bible, not just out of intellectual curiosity. That's, that's sort of the stragglers. Those are the people that come and go. Those of you who are committed to knowing this, you're committed to knowing these things because you want to apply them. You want the application, the understanding of these things and, and the application to have a direct bearing and effect on your life, the lives of your children, the world. And, of course, whatever um, post-existence there is. And I hope nobody's ever t gotten me wrong and and thought that I'm saying, I don't think there is existence beyond this life. I don't think I've ever said that. I have said that I think that our understanding of what existence there is, in what way, and so on and so forth, is probably not correct. And we've probably been influenced by a lot of pagan thought about heaven and hell and, and all of that, okay? I just want to know what the Bible has to say about it. And, and all of the clues concerning our experience here and, and why we were created. And this is why I'm going over origins in the Bible, um, or I'm sorry, the Obrey Hours, so that we can understand those things. We, we do want to understand what is potentially to come, because that will have an, a, a bearing on uh, our behavior, our application. If we're going to be punished for something, we should understand what we're being punished for. Um, Yahweh is, is not particularly <laughs> like the judges that sit on benches uh, in this country who say things like, Ignorance of the law is no excuse. Well, um, I, I'm not going to be presumptuous and speak for him at all. He does say my people perish for a lack of knowledge, you, you see. But that's why we should work very hard to know and understand these things. Um, but if we don't know, and if there is sufficient evidence that would convince us that the text has been changed in a radical way, and there is, I hope I've, I've illustrated this to you, 
I do often question. I do often question him, and I'm, I'm certain at a point I will get the answers in his timing, in his way. My question has been, how can anyone be held to account for things they don't understand? And, and, and furthermore, there is a, a great deal of, of evidence that would suggest that the way the Bible's been translated and presented to us is, is untrustworthy. So we're, we're in a pickle. We are. Um, and that's probably the, the main reason that I would encourage everyone to let's start at understanding the Bible, our epistemology. There's a lot of people out there I get very upset with because they're thinking to teach and they are using the current materials that we have that anyone, I being one of them, could illustrate are they're untrustworthy. Not entirely, but what's been done to them has to be examined. And this is what we're doing here. All right, plain and simple. I don't hate the Bible. I, I love the Bible. It's why this is almost the only thing I do is study the Bible and everything having to do with the Bible. If it has to do with the Bible, I'm probably studying it when I have time to study. Okay, so starting in Luke 6.20, and this only goes for half a chapter. So Luke's account of what we've come to know as the Sermon on the Mount, it, it covers only about a half a chapter in Luke. Okay, it is from uh, Luke 6.20, and it goes down to Luke 6.49. So almost 30 verses. And, and that is the entirety of the coverage Luke gives to this sermon. Where, on the other hand, Matthew's account of the sermon actually on a mount, <laughs> it starts in Matthew 5.3. And Matthew 5 has 48 verses. It goes to Matthew 6. Matthew 6 has 34 verses, so so far we're at about 80 verses worth of text, and goes on to Matthew 7, which has an additional 27 verses before it's ended. Okay, so that's a heck of a lot of verses. That's, you know, it's three to four times the, the girth of what we see being relayed in, in Luke. So what I did was I took the those subheadings that we get, you know, in those digital um, Bible modules, and I wrote them down, put them in two columns between Luke and Matthew. So what Luke gives us based on the the general uh, subheadings are uh, the Beatitudes, then Jesus pronounces woes, and those could really just be considered as a subtext to the Beatitudes. You'll see why then love your enemies, then judging others, then a tree and its fruit, then finally build your house on the rock. Where in contrast, Matthew's account begins with the Beatitudes, then the salt and the light, then Christ came to fulfill the law, then anger, then lust, then divorce, then oaths, then retaliation, which has been blended into what we see from Luke. So you could put that with the love your enemies, because since the Beatitudes, we haven't come to another point that Luke covers in this discourse until we get to love your enemies. Okay, Then giving to the needy, the Lord's Prayer, fasting, lay up treasures in heaven, do not be anxious, then judging others. So there's another point from, from Luke. Then ask and it will be given, the golden rule, and then a tree and its fruit, you remember that from Luke, and then the I never knew you part, and then build your house on the rock, and that's in Luke. Now, what I did was I also went through all of these points as they are, um, as they are appearing in Matthew's account of what we call the Sermon on the Mount, and I just 
wrote down where else in Luke I could find something like that. Now, sometimes what will happen is you'll find the exact text from Matthew's Sermon on the Mount in Luke in a completely different place, a completely different situation, and a completely different context. Now, why is that a problem? It is a problem because exegesis, okay, so this is the idea of um, elaborating correctly the text. So exegesis is very important because in, in exegesis you, you must consider context. Many of you are familiar with the sermons out there in which a preacher is going to take a verse or a very small passage and they're going to elaborate, they're going to teach something based on, on that. Which is, and what they do is they tend to, throughout that sermon or what they call any more today, they're just called messages, um, they tend to use a lot of eisegesis to prove their points as they go. So they'll just pull rando verses as they go to back up their point. And if, if they don't go into the context of each one of those verses that they're actually using to back up their, their main point to their message, massage, because that's all they're really doing most of the time is massaging everyone so that they're nice and relaxed and that wallet will slide right out of their pocket at the end of the sermon. And some nice music. we got to have some nice music. Make them feel uplifted, more emotional. Give. Give. So, that's really important. We, we always have to consider context. And we'll see some of the verses that either appear in a different context in Luke than they do in Matthew, and why that context matters. Last time, I talked at length about how chronology matters, because chronology really does matter. If you're proving or trying to prove why somebody did something, and one account says they did this thing before this happened, and another account says they did this thing after this thing happened, well, that's really important. This is why chronology is so important. It's just one of the reasons. I bet a chronologist, somebody who is like literally trained in chronology, and there's chronologists out there, they could tell you all of the reasons why chronology matters when you're documenting something. Okay? One of the reasons that chronology is so important, and this is why I'm pointing it out whenever I can as we go, because chronology, when something happened, in relationship to something else, tells us a great deal about why someone did something. If I'm just going to pull this out of the air, so this is really not alluding to anything, you know. Let's say we read that, that somebody invaded a city. Let's think about all the bad chronologies and, and, uh, and narratives we've been given. Let's just take World War II, because probably no more lies in our own day have been told about something in our own day than the, um, the facts of World War II. Let's say somebody invaded a city. Let's say the Germans went in, invaded, and occupied a certain place. So if we're not told chronologically what happened before that, we'll say um, they go up, they invade or, or, or occupy Denmark and Norway. Those evil Germans, they were trying to take over the world. And they just started with the, the countries of their brethren, right? Denmark and Norway. But chronologically, we're not given the right facts. We're not told that England was actually setting up blockades so that Germany could not import some very important resources that they needed to import. 
so that they had to go and occupy certain areas of those countries to keep the importation because it was affecting more than just Germany, these English blockades. Now, if, if chronologically we're told that, you know, England did this, so Germany did that, well, you understand. If you're not told at all that England did this, then you might think those evil Nazis, they were trying to take over the world, which most people do, unfortunately. Or if you were told it in the wrong order, then it would be completely weird if, if you were told, well, England went in and occupied these countries, or I'm sorry, Germany did, and then England set up a blockade. Well, now you would have a completely different understanding of why things happened when they happened. That's really important. Chronology is really important. I don't want people to think, well, he's talking about chronology and it being so out of whack between Luke and Matthew and he's just grasping at straws. He's just nitpicking. It's not nitpicking. Everything that has happened in my life has happened in a certain chronological order. And the things that happened yesterday, last week, last year, when I was 20, have an effect and a bearing on what is happening today. For a good reason. Why? Because they happen chronologically. And much of who I am or what I do today is because of what happened yesterday, last week, a year ago, and when I was 20. That's why it's so important. So the first thing I want to point out is the Beatitudes. Okay, the difference between the Beatitudes between Matthew and Luke. Now, apparently they got their name literally from your attitude should be. Be attitude. Okay, Beatitude. They're quite different between Luke and Matthew. Okay. Um, Luke's account has Jesus saying, um, Blessed be ye, and it's the be ye's in gray. So, in the base language, he would have literally have been accounted as saying, Blessed poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you, and then from their company is in gray, when they shall separate you and shall reproach and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Okay, that is, that's four Beatitudes in Luke's account. All right, now in Matthew's account, we have, Blessed are the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit. Luke says, Blessed are the poor. There's a big difference. Poor in spirit is a vastly different concept than poor. The poor in spirit. And if we take a look at the word for poor and do a word study and find out what words are used in obery for poor, we might get a better understanding of if he's talking about poor as in lack of money or lack of things. I mean, because you could look at poor in spirit and really just from those words and what we tend to understand about those words, you could say, is he talking about somebody who's like spiritually bankrupt? What does he mean? But that's important because we can find out a lot in Matthew's account because it's not blessed are the poor. That's somebody who doesn't have money. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay. That's a difference. But that's the same beatitude, right? Matthew 5, 4. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, this is similar 
to the third beatitude by Luke, blessed are you that weep. He says, blessed are you that weep because you will laugh. Um, weeping is not the same as mourning. I'm going to tell you. I have mourned and not wept. I have wept and not mourned. So in Matthew, blessed are they that mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Okay, that's the next one. Um, so again, there, there's not the meek here in Luke. It's just basically in Luke we've got blessed as far as poor, hunger now, weep now. And then those who are reviled for you show Jesus's namesake. In Matthew, the only matches we have is poor, but it's not a match because Matthew says poor in spirit. We don't have weep, we have mourn, not the same thing. In Matthew, we do have hunger but not for food. Matthew says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. It's just like in Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit. What did Luke say? He said, Blessed are you that hunger now, for you will be filled. Hunger? For what? For... If they don't have, as Matthew does, hunger and thirst after righteousness, or even if he would just say hunger for righteousness, he doesn't have to say thirst, then I would understand. I know what it feels like. I know what it feels like to hunger for righteousness. You'll be filled. But Luke says, you hunger. I know what it feels like to hunger for food. But according to Matthew, that's not what he's promising. He's saying if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you'll be filled. If you are hungry to be righteous, you'll be filled. It's not saying the same thing. If Luke is saying hunger, we think food. Hunger. Food. Hunger and thirst after righteousness, not food. Totally different thing. Okay, now there's that last beatitude from Luke. You know, blessed are you when you uh, men shall revile you for my sake. So in Luke's account, again, he said, blessed are you when men shall hate you, when they shall separate you from their company and reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice you in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Well, first thing I'd like to point out is he's not talking about Jews. If he talks about your fathers did to the prophets, he's talking about Israelites and Judahites. But I digress from that point. No, Matthew 5.10 says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Um, and in Luke it says, Cast your name as evil. Okay. Well, I have had the unfortunate opportunity in my life to tell others of the, the dirty dealings, dishonesty, or general bad character of people that I know because they had that bad character. They, they did those things. There were times in my life when I had that bad character and I did those kinds of things. 
And when people relayed that to other people, or I've had to to other people about others, that would be casting out their name as evil. Okay. The difference is, in Matthew, what he says is, they will say all manner of evil against you falsely. There is a difference. There's a difference. You can check the word ro, which is what's normally translated as evil in the Old Testament, and you will find that it has a somewhat subjective connotation to it. So it would be really important that he would interject here, again, falsely, instead of just evil. Okay? Because evil, oftentimes in the Old Testament, if, if you pay close attention there to the wording, you'll see that oftentimes evil has its just purpose. This is part of the whole this is part of the whole reason we misunderstand things like good and evil. This is why we keep erroneously believing in the great Satan myth. We don't understand that good and evil, Thub and Ro, both come from Yahweh. Not Thub or good coming from Yahweh and Ro or evil coming from the great Satan. That's not what the Bible teaches. And man can do evil. Evil, this word ro, is oftentimes subjective. And we could even say, in a sense, it's subjective when it comes to what Yahweh is telling us is good or evil. But here's the, the thing about it, whether it was sub uh, subjective or not. If he deems something as ro, evil, and this is something that goes against his substance, his character, who he is. Who he, who he is is what dictates what he does. If he deems something evil, then it is evil. Because he's the creator, he's the sustainer, he's the sovereign one. So, of course, anything that goes against his character is evil. But anything that we constitute as evil is subjective. And since we aren't the creator, the sustainer, the sovereign, doesn't have the weight that what he deems as ro, evil. Our understanding of these words, good and evil, they're very, they're very bad because of um, the way that from the Masoretes, and those who produced the Septuagint, the Vulgate, forward to those who produced almost all of our English translations and other language translations. They are imposing a... They are cladding it with a form of religion that does not oftentimes reflect what the actual text is appearing to be saying and, and trying to convey to us. Okay. Now in Matthew, he ends all of this with rejoice and be exceeding glad. Now he doesn't tell him to leap for joy. Okay, we could say that's nitpicking and that's fine. But he doesn't tell him to leap for joy in Matthew. He says, just be very glad. Um, there's nothing wrong with leaping for joy, but you know. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Okay, there are some differences. There are some sharp differences there. And one of the sharp differences there is you'll notice in Matthew, then he goes right from this onto the statement concerning the salt and light. Not so in Luke. In Luke, there are actually four contrasting passages that are, in a sense, they are addressing precisely just those four points from the beatitude portion of this. So Luke 6, 24 to 26, he says, But woe unto you that are rich. Now I have to go back to Matthew, specifying that it was poor in spirit. 
Now, if that's what he indeed said, was you that are poor in spirit, then Luke's account isn't complimentary because we would have to apply in spirit to this. He can't mean two different things. Poor in spirit and poor aren't the same thing. So if we see the, the, uh, the opposing point where he's given the four woes that, that all have a connection to those four Beatitudes, he says, but woe to you that are rich. Well, if, Matthew's, if this is just a complimentary account of Matthew's, Matthew clarifies and says in spirit, woe to you who are rich, what? In spirit? Woe unto you who are rich in spirit. Of course it doesn't make any sense that's the point no he's talking about in money and in, in in you know monetary things and worldly goods which is not what he's talking about in matthew so they're not complementary they're contradictory they're saying different things and when two accounts say different things they are not complementary so they do not agree with each other they do not harmonize and, and if I were a Charles Giuliani or, or anybody else who has offered criticism about the Bible, I would certainly include points like this. Is that what everybody wants? Does everybody want their desires so fulfilled so badly that they're just willing to keep going with all of this material not even covered by those who actually love the scriptures, who believe in the Aliyim, God thereof, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You want us to just ignore this and leave all of it just out like a raw piece of meat for hungry lions. Because that's what we're doing by not paying attention to these things and using some honesty and intelligence and integrity to solve what the problem is. So anyways, he says, Woe to you that are rich, you've received your consolation. So apparently he's saying in here, if you have a lot of money, you don't get consolation because having a lot of money is your consolation. And and I don't really see him reflecting that. Yahweh doesn't reflect that. Yahweh made many people in the um, other scriptures, oftentimes quite wealthy, bless them with a great deal of earthly gain. Now, the next point in Luke's woes is equally as troubling because his next woe is based on his second beatitude. He says, Woe unto you that are full for ye shall hunger. So if we go back to Matthew, of course, we see that he does add the, of course, that modifier, blessed are you which hunger and thirst after righteousness, right? For you will be filled. Now, in Luke's account, then he's doing these woes, woe unto you that are full. Well, then that is not complimentary to Matthew. Because in Matthew, of course, he says, Woe do you, or, you know, blessed are you that hunger and thirst, not for food, for righteousness. So this is not complementary and therefore is not in harmony with Matthew's gospel. Because there would be no woe unto anyone who are full if it was complementary to Matthew's gospel and it was full of righteousness. There would be no woe to anyone who was full of righteousness, nor would they be hungering for righteousness if they were full of righteousness. Now, the next one uh, Luke adds is, Woe unto you that laugh now. The thing is, in Matthew, there's just, there's just no talk about laughing. Do any of you remember... There was a gospel movie that was produced, oh, I don't know. I want to say it was like 20 years or so ago. I could probably just search for it because it just it was so ridiculous. Okay, so I just went and checked. 
So there wasn't a movie. I don't think there was a movie called Laughing Jesus, but I remember, I think it was the rendition that they produced called The Son of God. And they were talking about it. And they said, we wanted a Jesus that was more happy, more smiley, happy, and jovial. And, um, yeah, I'll tell you. It's funny because, first off, the prophets never describe him as being, he's going to be a happy guy, going to be happy, laughing, jovial, just smiling a lot. Buddy Christ. Buddy Christ. Doesn't it just pop? Uh, in fact, they describe him as being a man of sorrow. A man of sorrow. There's one thing I can confirm to you. And I know that frequently it comes across as just anger. Because a lot of times it is anger. Um, sometimes angry just at other people. More often than not, angry at myself. There is a sadness and there is a great burden that accompanies understanding the world, the people in it. There is a sadness and a burden that he would have borne understanding very well the state of the people of the covenants. Um, I mean, that's something that we see very clearly uh, throughout the Old Testament is the the terrible state in which we see these people of the covenants who were destined to do very wonderful things were also destined to be the people that Yahweh revealed himself through, which is a terrible burden. And they were bound for the worst times, the worst treatment, the worst sorrows and suffering because of the, as a direct response to their behavior, their lawlessness. And you showed Jesus, he understood that. And he understood that even what we had seen, the tribes and portions of the tribes that were by then gone from the good land that they were that they were given that they were bequeathed promised to Jacob um it had not even come in its in its fullness yet and there would be sorrows and suffering and grief far beyond that once his mission was complete and he had the burden of understanding those things. And of course, he did understand those things because he prophesied about a lot of them. So this idea of, uh, you know, we, we've got to, we have to focus more on how much he must have smiled and laughed. Well, if that's the case, then you're presenting a Jesus that's not reflecting the text. So anyways, yeah, this this laughing thing, like it's a great thing. Ha <laughs> ha, I love people that laugh. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, you can be full of joy and not laugh. You can laugh and not be full of joy. It's not the same thing. So I don't really know why Luke is so hung up on laughing. Matthew certainly is not. So, all right. Woe unto you that laugh, you laughers, for you shall mourn and weep. Um, 
And then really what he just does is he, uh, he hooks in what was the last verse in a few consecutive verses at the end of the Beatitudes as related by Matthew. He hooks that into the woe unto you here at the end. And it has direct relation to the um, rejoice when people speak badly of you, not falsely. Make your name evil. Okay, so then what we have is, is as I pointed out to you in the subheadings, we literally have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have seven points covered in Matthew's Gospel that aren't covered before we get to love your enemies that are covered by Luke. Now, as I said, there, there are various references to these things in Luke elsewhere. And I'll... You know, I can go over them to, to show you... Let's see. How should I say this? Um, I, I, could, I could go over them to illustrate to you the problem with these things being out of context. And I could just point out maybe a few of them. I don't really need to go over all of them. So here's how this context matters. In Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, he goes right from those Beatitudes, which there are, again, there are far more Beatitudes in Matthew. So he's actually, he's expounding far more <clears throat> on this idea that those people that possess certain qualities or certain desires, that those people are blessed, in fact, more than those who do not. Um, that seems more like it ought to be called the B conditions or B desires than B attitudes. But, um, Sure, your attitude has a lot to do with your condition or your desire, but this is what he's saying. Um, your desire. And then he ends with a conditional statement. And in the sense of, you are blessed when you're, you're persecuted for the sake of your righteousness. Remember, he said that you were blessed when you hungered and thirsted for that righteousness. He said that a few verses before. Um, and you are blessed when you are reviled and persecuted, and your name is spoken of falsely, when people accuse you of things that aren't true. And many of us have been in this condition. We understand this state. I have. Okay, and then he goes on. Um, to just answer that at the end, rejoice and be exceeding glad, uh, for your reward is great in heaven. The substance of that whole passage is him speaking of your condition based on your, your desires and your state. Um, how you behave, what your wants are, they have a lot to do with who you are and your condition. And then he goes on directly after this in Matthew to say, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. Who's he speaking to? Israelites. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle. You see, he's not speaking to Christians. There's no such thing when he's giving the Sermon on the Mount. He's speaking to Israelites. That's who he came to minister to. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that may, they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And he's talking about a condition. What your condition is. Why that is a good thing. That's why he relates it to salt and the condition of salt. He's talking to people. Specific genetic profiled people. 
You're the salt of the earth. But if the salt's lost its flavor, how how shall it gain? Where Where is it going to get its flavor from if you're the salt of the earth? You're not good for anything but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. Uh, a side note here. That's only going to be well understood by people who live in an environment where the ground gets iced frequently because that's what salt is used for when it's thrown on the ground. It's to melt ice. That doesn't happen in Palestine. If you see pictures of like Jerusalem where it's snowing, that happens, it's less than once a blue moon and it doesn't stick. He's talking to people who are used to their environment being icy so that you have to throw salt on the ground. Why? What salt do you throw on the ground? You, so, you throw salt on the ground that is only good for one thing, melting ice, and then it's trampled underfoot. It's a great illusion he's making, a great metaphor he's making, of course. And then he goes on to the, the lighting of the candle, putting it under a bushel. Um, it, it goes back to the same results is when he said uh, the salt's not good for anything but to be thrown onto the ground and trampled underfoot by men which is what Israel and Judah found their state being in time okay so this is the same thing with with your light why were they the light because they were the children the literal genetic children of the covenants made with Abraham Isaac and Jacob and as per those covenants Yahweh said to them that through you, all the nations, the Adame, would be blessed. This is why he's speaking to a specific genetic people. And, and here's that context that this salt passage is in. However, when we go to Luke, and not only is this passage far removed in chronological order, we see it uh, far forward, actually eight chapters forward from Luke's account of the Sermon on the Plain. <laughs> um, and this is the context. So just before that, he's going over counting the cost of discipleship. One thing that's interesting, and I'll, I'll probably go over this again later. In Luke, he says, if any man come to me and does not hate his father, his mother, his wife, and children. That's not what Matthew says. Okay? It's strong language, right? Doesn't hate his father? Oh, why would you hate your father, mother, wife, or children? In Matthew, he says, love me more. And who was he? The way, the truth, the life. Who does not love the way, the truth, the life? More, not hate. But Luke says hate. So whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, and he goes into the counting the cost, who and sits down to, uh, or, or is going to build a tower without sitting down to build it, what king goes to make war without counting the cost, whether he can win the battle or not. I'm talking about counting costs. He said those who would follow me, the way, the truth, the life, who would follow me, would live by me, count those costs count those costs because it's going to cost it costs folks i'm telling you it costs it exacts a heavy emotional mental often financial cost there is a cost costs with an s Okay, and, and this is also relayed in other Gospels, this same sort of idea. It is different than the idea that's being relayed in what we saw in the, uh, the Beatitudes, so-called. Okay, this is quite different. In context with the Beatitudes, he follows those up with the idea of salt, and then he further elaborates on this idea of salt and it's losing its flavor with the light, the candlestick, on the hill. However, 
In Luke, it's taken far out of chronological order, so thus far out of context. And he's not even speaking of the same thing, because in Luke, he's talking about the counting the costs of following him. And then in Luke 43, So likewise, whosoever be of you that forsaketh not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Very different than what we're talking about in Matthew with the Beatitudes. Then he follows it up in Luke 14, 34, and 35. Salt is good. Yes. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It's neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill. But men cast it out, and he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now that's, folks... Besides the fact that it's far out of chronological order, besides the fact that it's far out of context in a different context, and that matters. He's also saying something different here, because in Matthew, he's talking about salt. We know what salt is. We know what it's good for. Salt is very good for seasoning. It's very good. People need salt. You can't... Live your life without salt. You need salt. It's good for seasoning. You need salt. But if it didn't have its flavor, it's just a little rock or mineral. And what it is good for, whether it was had a good flavor or not, whether it was full of uh, sand particles, like a lot of the table salt they sell us today is full of, which I wouldn't recommend buying and using that, or not, one thing it's still good for, and this is important, and he points it out in Matthew, is it can be thrown on the ground and it's trampled underfoot by men. It's thrown on the ground to melt ice and snow. That's its use. It's useful in doing that. No matter what, it could be mixed with sand, it could be whatever, and it's going to be good for melting snow and ice. Throw it on the ground. It's going to be stepped on, walked all over, because that's all it's good for. And it is good for that. But Luke seems to disagree, because in Luke's account, he says that he said, it is neither fit for the land. It's not. He says, nor yet for the dunghill. But men cast it out. They throw it away, so it's not even good for melting snow and ice, which we know it's good for. But men cast it out. Now, whether you want to argue for the efficacy of old salt in melting snow and ice or not. What you can argue with is the fact that these two authors not only are saying different things, these quasi-different things are being put into different contexts and different chronological orders. Thus, these accounts are not complementary. They are contradictory. Gosh, folks, you know, I just paused it so I could review uh, the, the points that I had made be between um, Matthew and Luke in, in this sermon, whether it be on a mount or a plane. And it's not just the chronology. And it's, it's not entirely just the fact that contexts and meanings because of varying context change. There's so much difference in these points that they deserve the light of day. So this will this will go on for some time because to be honest, I don't really want to skip over any of them. Um for one thing, if I did, it it might not give you I think the most fair an accurate contrast between simply Luke and Matthew. And again, as I said, you could contrast this with other books too, and you would find a great deal of, of contrasts, not complementary, contradictory contrasts. Um, as I, I, I explained in the first video, I'm using Matthew as the control, because out of all the Gospels, Matthew is the gospel that most 
accurately reflects just on the surface text without us having to really dig in and find out about some of those problem, uh, problematic passages, even just on the surface text, has the greatest bulk of material that positively and accurately links the, the birth, the purpose of, the life, the death of Yusho Jesus to the, uh, the body of the Old Testament. That's why Matthew is standing as our control here. But, but here's the thing, whether it was our control or not, I could have done the same thing with the Gospel of John. I could have done the same thing with the account of Mark. Okay? And I could show you how these aren't complementing, they are contradicting, and what the problem is with that. Because there's a problem with that, folks. It's a problem. And we have to find out the nature of the problem and how we must overcome this. That's the point. So the next thing is the law. So I'll start in Matthew because Matthew is following Matthew's following a, a more logical progression here, as we see in his version of the Sermon on the... <laughs> Sorry. Because it's ridiculous. I mean, that's just so obviously a contradiction. It's on the mount. Is it a below the mount on a plane? Anyways. So we have a logical train of thought here in Matthew. Okay. Beatitudes, salt and light which directly related to Beatitudes. Now, from the salt and light directly afterwards, we have this. Think not I am come to destroy the law or prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. That's important because it relates to the previous statement, the salt, who it's lost its flavor. The Israelites, who did not keep the law as per the agreement with their fathers at Sini, or Mount Harab. So it's all connected, it all relates, and it's all important that it's in this placement as we go to understand what he's saying. He goes on, For verily I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and teach men to do so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that except your righteousness shall exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. What did the scribes and the Pharisees do? The scribes and the Pharisees oftentimes taught all kinds of superfluous things that were not per se the law. Yusho even told them that they make the law to no effect by teaching us traditions that which is the law. Your righteousness should exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, or you can't even hope to be part of the kingdom of heaven. And I would say anyone who would be teaching against the law based on these statements, if they even are part of the kingdom of heaven, should be considered the least. And I know somebody, Luke knows somebody, who made many statements contradicting the law, teaching against the law, teaching people to do things that were contradictory to the law. So this is all important because it follows a logical, coherent thought process. And he's going to go on after that. This is all staying in the same, the same logical flow of thought. What came before it, what comes after it, because what comes after it, he's going to go into points of the law 
and he's going to relate that to your attitudes and desires which he started out the Sermon on the Mount with, in Matthew anyways. Not, not so in Luke. Luke does, I will say, I will say this. Luke has five major points in his rendition of the Sermon on the Plain. Matthew has the same five points, and they both follow in the same order. However, <laughs> Matthew's actually has a great deal. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20. Same thing with what we just compared in chapters, verses. It's about four times longer. Now, that those are just subheadings that the text put in, so I'm not counting those as, you know, this is rock solid. That's just what they put in. However, there is a great deal more to what he's saying, and you understand it far better. Unfortunately, we're not at one of the main points that we can, you know, check with Luke, but we do have a cross-reference in Luke. To that, think not I came to destroy the law. That's very important based on the previous statement he just made about the salt losing its savor, or the light, uh, or lighting a light and putting it under a bushel. A people that were in covenant with Yahweh, so that he would reveal himself through that relationship to that people with the world, and they have that light and putting it under a bushel not keeping the law, and not paying attention to these things. But in Luke, it shows up in Luke 16, 17, which is, I don't even have to point this out, you know, chronologically, it's 10 chapters ahead of, of even where Luke's sermon, sermon on the <laughs> plane is. And here it is in context. Now that context is, it's basically sandwiched in between two parables, if you want to call these parables. The first parable is the parable of the dishonest manager. And I'll tell you something. Listen, man. I, I started, I was going to write a blog that I was actually going to put on my website. And I began it. And I actually started with... A, addressing two parables from Luke. These two parables, the parable of the dishonest manager and Lazarus and the rich man. Why? <laughs> because first off, people wrestle over these so badly because they find it nearly impossible to get around what it's actually saying. Because what it's actually saying, first off, is not vouched for in any other gospel or by the Old Testament. Um, it's also one of the things that's used um, that preachers have often used to um, uphold the idea that, that usury would be okay in certain situations. I'm sure John Calvin slash Cohen would have loved that one. But also, Lazarus and the Rich Man, which appears at the end, is one of the chief passages that those who are pro-eternal burning torment in hell for a, a lifetime of sins, if that, doesn't appear in any other gospel, has not a second witness for it. And that's important. We want to have a second witness. <sighs> So, in this parable of the dishonest manager, the, the guy, he's, he's, a, he's a terrible manager. So, his, his employer tells him, hey, I'm going to fire you. Get your stuff together. I want you out of here in a certain time. And it says that this guy, he thinks to himself, he th it's like, I, I'm serious, man. You read this, and if you don't have the um, the imposed beliefs in your in your head that it's good, what he's saying is good. These got to be the words of Jesus. They got to be good. If you don't have that in your head, and you read this, you're like, this guy sounds like a like a dishonest Jew, man. What's a why? 
is he t why is he telling a story about him because he turns out to be like he's commending him for his behavior the guy literally first off he screws over his master when he tells him you're dismissed why was he dismissed not because his master was dishonest because he sucked at his job he was a crappy manager he was dishonest lame that's why he was dismissed so what does he do he says to himself oh man i'm screwed now i can't do this job anymore which afforded him a really nice position um i'm gonna be stuck living with these people that i've been collecting from for my master who i you know he wasn't forthright and honest and decent with them either so what does he do he thinks of himself he doesn't think what's good what's right what's just he thinks of himself and he writes these uh these new contracts with the people who owe his master things not necessarily money things there were agreements that they entered into with his master and now they owed and um so he shortchanges his master <laughs> and he tells these people he says how much do you you owe him this much all right well quickly we're going to change the contract to you owe him this much and quickly we're going to change the contract and now you owe him this much and then he says the lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light well when you look at this you and actually i'm sorry this one doesn't have usury in it i, I apologize it is a very difficult parable for people to deal with now his master may have actually been an unjust man too it doesn't say that it says he was dismissed for being a bad steward and then if said if his lord commended him for what he did the only thing he could have commended him for was because he had exercised um <laughs> very unjust deeds towards his master you know his employer the guy who pays him to do whatever he does and if this guy is a rotten guy his master then he was paying him to um exercise his rottenness <laughs> over these people so it says that he commended him maybe he commended him for being rotten okay um it's really hard to make out exactly what he's saying here now he does say that you know the children of the world in this generation wiser than the children of light and i say to you this luke 16 9 make yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness now you know that goes against other statements that Yusho has made about mammon how one can't be a friend of mammon or serve mammon and serve Yahweh God but in Luke's account which is nowhere else to be found or statements similar to be found he says make yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness that when you fail they may receive you into everlasting habitations what what and then it seems that a line from other parables and other gospels is then inserted here he's that faithful in the least is faithful in much it's just really twisted man okay and then you have lazarus and the rich man and that has its whole its whole baggage to unpack right there okay so we'll say coming right out of this parable of the unfaithful steward in luke 6 14 we go into it says and the pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things <clears throat> and they derided him and he said unto unto them you th are they which justify yourselves before men but god knows your hearts for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of god the law and the prophets were until john since that time the kingdom of god is preached and every man presses into it 
Now, I probably shouldn't do this because we aren't to Luke 16 in my notes. But that right there, that statement, I don't think that's reflected in Matthew or the other Gospels. So he says, the law and the prophets were until John, and since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. And this expression is used a lot um, by CI trying to prove that Udeus in the New Testament is Jew, as we understand Jew today, as opposed to it being the logical, obvious transliteration of Judah. Uda is the root. It's got about 22 variations, but its root is Huda, Iuda, Yuda, Judah. And then in Luke 16, 17, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Now, it's just strange. It just doesn't seem to fit that context really well. And then he seems to fly from left field to right or right to left after that and talk about the putting away the wife, and marriage. Just bizarre. To me, it's just bizarre. However, in Matthew, it's all very logical and very consistent. He is following a train of thought. Okay. And then he goes on to discuss anger and the points of the law in contrast to your desires and your attitude. It's all coherent. It's all consistent. It all follows a logical form in Matthew. All of it. This whole thing we've seen so far. However, in Luke, See, the next point that's going to be the same between Luke and Matthew is the love your enemies point, which will come up in Matthew by the time we get past this idea of um, retaliation. Now, there are points to this that we could go over in the meantime, and they're very important points. They might seem very exhaustive in the sense that, wow, this is just so much and all rotating around this. Well, the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew is absolutely a centerpiece to the ministry of Yeshua Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount is, is a centerpiece. The the parables, the interaction that he has the last time he goes to Jerusalem before he is killed or sacrifices himself, and his prophecies of what's to come, Matthew 24, these are pillars. Pillars, strong, stable pillars in the account of Matthew. In Luke, there is so much disconnected combobulation of these ideas. One of the notes that I, I made to myself after I had, uh, the first time that I had reviewed and contrasted um, Matthew's Sermon on the Mount and Luke's Sermon on the Plain, um, I said in my notes that it was so discombobulated, so different, and they, and that Luke's account was so bereft of the logical, consistent flow of thought that I saw in Matthew, that I wrote in my notes that it was as if the author of the account of Luke had taken the specifics of the Sermon on the Mount had cut them all up into separate sections, thrown them up in the air, and then pieced them back together however he chose to. And not just in the, the, um, the account of Luke's Sermon on the Plain, 
it's these little snippets that we'll find all through, which is why I think it's important to actually address how we see these concepts being found in context in a logical, consistent flow of thought in Matthew's account, and then finding them just strewn, like as though they were just peppered and all through Luke's, and how important that is to how it affects our perception of what he said, what he meant, his purpose, and his ministry. They cast an extraordinarily different light on all of these things when we see them far out of context. And of course, they're not just out of context. They're oftentimes not even quoted uh, faithfully or similarly, as we saw in that contrast between how the Beatitudes are worded in Luke, hunger or hunger for righteousness, huge difference. And in Matthew, and the salt, and him saying it was just thrown out instead of used and trampled underfoot by men, which is was so important and so prophetic concerning the relationship and the burden that Israel, the sons, the genetic sons and daughters of Jacob, Israel, would suffer. So important. And Luke, even though that passage is far out of context and out of chronology, he even removes the point to throwing it out and it being trampled underfoot. And we also lose the fact that for you to see salt in that manner, um, you have to live in an environment that is temperate where you would need salt on the ground because it's the only good thing salt is used for on the ground is melting ice. So um, with that, I'm going to stop. I'm going to just, on the next one, I'm just going to pick right back up in the Sermon on the Mount because it's one of these chief pillars to uh, you show Jesus' ministry. And it is vital in us having a, I think, a very clear, um, honest, honest, rational opinion of, of how helpful and truthful and trustworthy the account of Luke actually is. So um, until the next one, uh, take care.